Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Nice, nice to have you here. I, um, I'll introduce myself because I, I think there's a lot of new faces here, which is wonderful. I'm Bob Willie, and I've had the privilege over the last number of years to serve as the president of the Friends of the Georgetown Library. I know some of you are from the Waccamaw Library, but uh, this privilege of mine to be able to be president of the Friends of the Georgetown Library. And this is a part of a series um, that we call Tuesdays With, the third Tuesday of each month, all the way from September through May. Uh, we have a lecture series here, and we're excited to uh, have wonderful speakers on all different topics, um, primarily related uh, to this Georgetown area and people who are gifted and uh, be able to share with us on various occasions. We call it Tuesdays With because it comes from a 1997 bestseller, Tuesdays With Maury. And uh, we make a connection with that book because it's a wonderful story about a college student and a college professor that went far beyond the 18 to 21 year old period of time and continued far into uh, their later years and talks about the fact that we are as no matter what our age is, continually involved in continuing education and learning. And so today we're going to be privileged to have with us Libby Bernadine, who's going to be able to share with us, I know, uh, in a powerful way, the power of poetry in her most recent book, um, as you can see right here, House in Need of Mooring. This is one of those where I have to introduce myself because a lot of you don't know me. I don't think I need to introduce Libby. In fact, <laughs> why don't I call on some of you to introduce Libby? <laughs> Uh, from your own experiences and uh, your interactions with her. But what a gifted individual, wonderful person. This is actually the third time we've had Libby speak in our series. Um, I've had uh, this responsibility for seven or six years now, and during that period of time, three different occasions, this is the third, that Libby has been here to be able to speak. We actually had an introduction to our previous book and now this book, and to be able to book a poetry and to be able to uh, have her here as a guest with us. This is a wonderful noise out here. I just want you to know, if you're upset by the noise, we've been waiting for quite a while. And for those of you who don't know, I better give a background quick in case we do have this noise going on for a little while. Um, we received a wonderful gift uh, from a person from our community to be able to build a new auditorium, which is what they're building out here. That's what it's all being torn up. It's an auditorium for those of you from Waccamaw, about the same size as the Waccamaw because you can see this is not quite that size. And in addition to that then, to totally renovate the interior of this building. This was the first of the library buildings in the Georgetown County system. And so now we're catching up with all the others, the walls, the floors, the ceilings, the HVAC, everything is gonna be new. And it's gonna be a wonderful renovation. So that's what's gonna be going on over the next year and a half or so. Anyway, so if you hear the noise, we're celebrating that noise. And I hope it doesn't interfere. Somehow you can tie that in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, join me in welcoming Libby. Thank you so much, Bob. Can you hear me? Those of you in the back, can you hear me? Great. Gosh, what a great crowd. I've got poets in this, um, in this group, and I've got, I know, book club people in this book, in the in here today, so I'm thrill, thrill, really thrilled to have you. Um, thank you, Bob. You always give me such a nice introduction. Makes me feel just great, ready to get started. And Bob's done so much for the library. We're very grateful for the leadership over the years that he's given. Um, I also want to thank Julie Thank you, Julie. She did the um, PowerPoint, because I'm going to talk a little bit about um, kind of a mini conversation about poetry, what it is that um, at least I see as important in, in writing poetry. But Julie Warren is going to help me do that, because she's put together a beautiful PowerPoint presentation. I am totally. Well, not totally, but I'm pretty much um, technology deficient. But all I have to do, I understand, 
is hit one key. So let's hope I can get to where I need to get and you can enjoy it. I thought I would read a bit after I do the little mini conversation about what I want to talk about very briefly is the idea of when we approach a poem we don't know, we begin to, um, I don't know, we, under the best of circumstances, I'll put it this way, we experience the poem. And while, um, I'll sh I'll, shortly I'll show you a quote where um, Rainier Maria Milk, uh, Wilkie said that um, the idea of feelings in a poem is a good idea, but the more important thing is to think about the experience that the poem brings to a reader. So um, I'm going to just take one little poem and share all that with you. When I read a new poem, I do wonder how it came about, even if I've read the writer's poem or other works by the particular poet, I still wonder, well, how did he get started? And sometimes I feel like I have a certain way of getting started and I shun others like I, for a long time, I said, I don't use props. I don't need props. But I found out that prompts turned out to be a very good idea and I'll give you an example of that shortly. Um, the poet Major Jackson has said that he questions the value of poetry. He even questions his own um, involvement in it. He is a, a nationally, internationally known extraordinary poet. Um, and I, I kind of associate myself with that idea is why am I involved with it? And it's a question I can't answer except to say this is the best way I can express what matters to me and what I see out in the world that I need to comment on. So let's try and see if it works. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Um, so when I got started with my book that I'm going to read from today, House in Need of Mooring, I, it was during the pandemic year. And while I'm a person used to being at home writing and staying at home and being to myself when I need to be to myself, as all of us did, I think we got pretty, um, felt isolation maybe a little bit more. And we were worried. Um, I think one of the reasons this title worked out is we were going through so much, not just the terrible virus that we were experiencing, but so many terrible events occurring, school shootings and all kinds of events that are, um, were overwhelming for us. So I think that it was important to me to begin to look inward even more so and more deeply. And I think having the time just to be home all of the time, except for doing the laundry, I didn't have to have any kind of uh, bother. No one had to bother me and I didn't have anything I had to do. I, didn't, I let my hair grow long, my nails grow long. And you know the story. Okay, so let's look at this poem. Well, first let's look at this photograph. This is Phil, my partner Phil Wilkinson's photograph, as are all the rest. And when you look at that, I'm sure you see what a beautiful photograph it is. But what comes to your own sensibility? What comes across? Just throw out a word or two, like, does it seem a bit lonely? Awakening. Awakening. Beautiful. What else do you see? Confining. Confining. The, the jetty going out. Anything else? Calming. Calming. Okay. 
And way out on the horizon, um, you can see that boat that um, it could be a ship. It might be, I guess, since we can see it from shore. But I've always been fascinated by this particular picture of Phil's because it's so balanced in beauty and also in mystery. Where does it take us? And I think that's what a poem will do if we let it. If we open ourselves to the experience of the poem, it can take us somewhere in our own experience. Okay, let's just read this poem by Langston Hughes, and I'll just make a few remarks, and then I'll get on to my own reading. Island One, wave of sorrow, do not drown me now. I see the island still ahead somehow. I see the island and its sands are fair. Wave of sorrow, take me there. Um, Again, what comes to your mind? Let the language work for you. What you, if you have, has anyone seen this poem before? I, I never have, and I know a few Langston Hughes poems, and you probably are familiar with the poem Harlem, What Happens to a Dream Deferred. Um, so what does the language give us that we might begin to think about? the poem itself. Just shout out a word. Hope. Hope? Good. <laughs> what else? Rhythmic, like the wave would be. I think a word was rhythmic, rhythmical, like a wave would be. Like I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah. Like Wonderful. Like yeah. I had not thought of that. They look like little islands. Yeah. Right. Anything else? Silence. What, Vinny? Silence. S silence? Yes. Um, one of the things I think is important to a poem when you're approaching it is let the silence work for you. Um, I like to think that this is a, a four stanza poem with couplets in each stanza and there's space between each stanza. And I like to think of letting the silence in this poem work for me as to what could I fill in, what from my experience makes me kind of connect. And I might begin to think of a particular detail. Well, is the, um, there is a narrator. We don't know who he is or she is unless we want to just say, oh, it's Langston Hughes, which it may well be. But the, uh, the drowned <coughs> sorrow and the wave, all of that, that movement, that just makes me think that there's something, an aim, which takes me back to your word, hope, that there is some hope in this poem. If you know anything about Langston Hughes, you know that he was a member of the, um, a, the Harlem Renaissance. And I guess most of his work came about in 20s, 30s, and 40s. He was very productive. And he wrote for, um, he, he's, a lot of his poems dealt with justice and fairness. And I, when I got to the word fair, um, that's what I begin to think about. Maybe there's some issue for Langston Hughes about fairness in race. I don't know that. That's just how it affected me. What about security? The island would be a sanctuary. That is my BFF from high school. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a little bit longer. <laughs> well, I don't know. What she, she was a salutatorian of the class. And once she asked me about a question on a test, and she claims I gave her the answer, and I went, yeah, I gave you the answer? No way. I did. I made 100%. <laughs> <laughs> and I failed, probably. 
Um, anyway, yeah, I think that this, that's a real possibility that the security that might be in, in the poem. So thank you all for... Libby, I, I thought of the grieving process that initially you feel like you're drowning in it. And then, then you can see that there will be peace, but it's still far away. And then you get to the stage where you're beginning to come to terms with it, and you see that there is going to be peace on the other side. But then the last stage is... Yeah, we, we get taken to the peace, but there's always going to be a little sorrow. Yes, it's, and it's like that there could even be an ambition that maybe the grief could not be just the death of someone, but the struggle mm -hmm. to get where he wants to go, where the person in the poem wants to go. So here's a poem that is, could be far more richer the more we know about Langston Hughes, which I don't have time to go into. I know he was a big favorite of Martin Luther King's, especially the Dream Deferred poem. Anyway, thank you for sharing. And um, I'll move on. But just re the point is to think about what experience can a poem bring to you. And here are some quotes. Um, and the one I had mentioned earlier for, from Rilke, for poems are not as people think, simply emotions. One has emotions early enough. They are experiences. And I think that's a very powerful comment about poetry and what it can do for you. Um, I'm not going to read the first one, but I'll just say that one of the things I do in trying to write my poems is to bring big words, death, love, sorrow, into something very specific. And I hope you find that that works for me. Um, but one of the things that I have, have, Dan, I know you've heard me use this Ellen Bass quote. I've just taken with it. I feel like it's my mantra now. One of the things that poetry does is to bear witness to the world as it is. And that's the point I think I began to dwell on more where I certainly am interior when I write. I feel, my process, I feel very spiritual about it. But I've learned to be more observant. What's happening in the world? I might not like what's happening in the world. I might not want to write about it, but yet I feel propelled. Somehow it drops into the poem. And I, you'll see some examples of that. And there's another Phil Wilkinson um, partial slide. I think you cut that down for me, didn't you, Phil? You cropped it. But pelicans on post and see the coots beginning to come in. Um, that poem, I mean that um, photograph is an ephrastic po uh, poem in that I took this poem from Phil's beautiful um, photograph. So I'll read the um, poem. I got to get to my numbers. I think it's 22. OK, Habitat. Home, harbor. I'd like to keep the uh, slide up instead of putting the words to the poem up. As in a flock of coots gliding in a path winding slip of water through cattails in breeze bending marsh, 
as in a small john boat, moored after men fished for spot-tailed bass, the catch of the day enough to feed a family of four. As in abiding by limits, leaving behind the not needed. As in peaceful places, despite dangers living there. As if left alone, the alligator is at home, warming on the bank in winter sun and in brackish waters, where wild rice and millet flower feed blue winged teals, wood ducks and pintails in bulrush, sweet grass enough to weave and plait baskets to sell. As in seven ring-billed gulls perched on pilings, tails to the wind. Now, in the photograph, there is no alligator and there is no um, John boat and some of the things that I put in the poem. But in an aphrastic poem, you want to give the description of the um, photograph, but you don't, you can, you can put in what's important to you because it's your poem that you're beginning to make. And this, Phil and I usually do Christmas cards where he does the photograph and I do the poem. And I think this was one we did one year. We don't worry about holly and trees. and We just write and use what we think matters to us and we want to share with you. So when you hear me read my poetry, I want you to think about, not, of, not about me, but about you, and where does my poem take you? And if you don't like it, ask me a question. As I go through, you're welcome to interrupt me. So I mentioned that the only, the only way I can make big thoughts um, real is to put it into something very specific. So I'll start with grief. When my husband died, I was not able, I, put, I couldn't write. A lot of people write during a time of grief, but I, for five years I didn't write a poem after he died. But I think when Phil and I got together, speaking about your word, safety, Betty, I was able to feel the confidence to begin to think about writing about what the experience had been. Breathe. Some mornings are dappled, spaces and tree limbs awash with light, like flashes of insight. I sit on the hospital steps, the lady, the good stranger asking, how can I help? I stumble to answer. Forgot. I stumble to answer. Words scramble, unable to climb the wall, refuse speech. I think of how I broke the milk glass bowl, the one I bought with green stamps, saved from a grocery store campaign. That bowl held my life, shattered on the kitchen floor. Sweep it away, breathe, concentrate on trees. Leaves shake in wind, they sing for you. Take the first step, breathe. A more recent death, about two years ago, my very close friend, Bobby Kennedy, who was vice president of ETV, who was a very CEO kind of person in business, and we always said woo-woo on the other side. <laughs> she, she just was marvelous at talking about, this group was a dream group that we belonged to, and we discussed our dreams in a safety little area that was important to us. And it was like, it's, you go to Las Vegas, what happens there stays in Las Vegas. That's the way our dream group was. And Bobby was kind of our high priestess, 
because she had so much belief about spiritual life and could share it and talk about it in such a way. And we were devastated when she died. And now the empty space, remembering Bobby. Think of a coffee cup, a smear of lipstick on its rim there on the kitchen table. Think of your ritual every morning, putting curlers in your hair, curl, spray, comb out. Think of the owl swooping down from the oak, graceful as a swirl of chiffon, dark eyes watching. Even after it flew away, its image imprinted for days. Think of you in the back seat of that cramped van, we travelers wondering why the car rental ignored our pleas for the larger excursion. You, our head honcho on the phone, this is not acceptable. Words left hanging in the air, like all the Jungian dreams tangled in our talk. And now the empty space, the veil between us, an echo in the ether. And when the owl flies, I am on its wing. Bobby said during that um, event, she was on the phone, this, this is not acceptable. Let me speak to your supervisor. <laughs> so believe me, I've said that a few times. She gave me courage. That's the way she was. The, owl, the, the, the image of the owl in here is the, I actually went out on my porch back in the day when they delivered my newspaper. I don't get it anymore here. Um, I go, went out to get the paper and I heard this kind of swoosh or something sound like that. And I looked over in the corner of my yard and there was this huge, gorgeous barred owl just looking at me. And I was so thrilled by it. I felt like something really important had happened. So being stupid, I went and got my camera and when I came back, <coughs> he was gone. But I do remember that, that image. And here's an example of a poem that I start out one way and what's happening in the world comes in and I didn't plan it. The price for long lives is sorrow. You could say a long and measured life walks with a dream Mysteries clotheslined across the sky, blowing like sheets. Worn out stories, letters spelling worn out stories. What am I to do with Joseph of the many colored coat, an imprisoned Hebrew with God inspired dream talk? Pharaoh chose him who stored the grain to save plague torn Egypt. And where are the Josephs among us? The would-be king, thank God, is gone. We have a new leader. May he be among the long-lived, for we the people who haven't the courage of a sharecropper's son crossing the bridge, first to violence, last to peace, always his aim. His case on marches. Remember his long life of sorrows, his scattered, good trouble seeds, like wildflowers, purple fringed, lily leafed, sweet shrub, spice bush, blood root, uproot into the world, blossom, blossom. South, a brief history. And now the rain, rivets of water stream from the backyard. I'm reading Natasha Trethaway's poems of her mother, once married to her white Canadian father. Mississippi, my own mother's native state, Gulfport, where my grandparents are buried, Alvin and Nell, the preacher and his wife at peace on hallowed ground. 
Once at a talk by a Southern writer, I heard a woman from Ohio tell a woman from Chicago the reason her son's wife didn't have a Southern accent was that she was educated. We all have our presumptions. Natasha the Laureate returns to the South holding the ghost of generations. I return to Mississippi, state that made a crime of me, mulatto, half-breed. Mulatto, offspring of one white parent, one black, also Creole child of maybe Spanish, maybe French in America. Natasha, <coughs> writing the blend of worlds. My father says my grandmother refused to speak to my great aunt Maud, whose child was born creamy, rich, dark. That guilt, caught by it, unknowingly nurtured, we all carry our beliefs' pain. Out of history comes Paul Rosen, singing of the do-nothing river, of back-breaking work, of bondage, his voice water-deep before crossing the road in a king tide. I had the pleasure, any of English teachers in here? Yes, you are, David. <laughs> I had the pleasure, I had the pleasure of hearing, um, of being in William Stafford's presence twice. But the first time was at uh, Council of Teachers of English um, in Chicago. And he was there, worked with a few of us teacher, poet kind of people, and um, he, gave us a prompt. He said, um, I want you to think of the phrase from this thread and see what happens. As you don't think about it, just write what comes into your mind, kind of a uh, free writing kind of thing. And so I did, and I didn't much like what I did, and I thought that was, that was it, that was fun. But I began to really look at it and think of myself as the um, oldest of, the, of a family of four children. And I was thinking what it meant to be the firstborn in, in a family. And I began to work on the poem, and this is what came out. I'm going to take a sip. Firstborn, here's the strand, here's this strand, pulled from the navel of my grandmother, wound round the slim hips of my father, who aroused the curving of my mother's cells, clustered against her heart, while she embroidered a scant, incipient knot, kept coiled within, dividing once, then twice, then four times. Until the silvered morning, I skimmed across sleep to cradle my firstborn, the thread intact, until his love for this new girl stitched it to her to let it live in the child. Its tight length knotted the now. Am I doing all right on time? Um, I wrote, I don't write much about my children or grandchildren, although my grandchildren, the ones, they're all adult now, and they're all getting married. Since I had three children in three years, they all had children that <laughs> came along at the same time. But um, anyway, I'm, April 1st, I'm going to a wedding, uh, my, one of my grandsons, but they've all asked me to read poems, and they asked me, that, that's what thrilled me so much about it, they asked me would I write and read a poem at the wedding, which I have done, 
and the one that's getting married in September has already asked if I would read a poem at, at their wedding. But I did write this poem about my son because the image of him starting first, uh, starting kindergarten was such an amazing, it just stuck with me. All, all through these years, I've me remembered very poignant, poignantly that moment um, of taking him to the, to the kindergarten first grade. I mean, first time. Morning after my son's birthday. If he were here, I wouldn't read this. He, he, but he's not here, is he? <laughs> Morning after my son's birthday. I wake in the groggy pleasure of a day welcome. Watch leaves flutter from turning trees. Wind moving among branches. My heart falls silent. Nothing brings more joy, son of his father, who marked him from day first to be the man he is. Solid, as though stone in a creek bed, stone staying power, even as millennia gene shapes curl and color of hair, of eyes, of bone, sinew, muscle. It's breathtaking, I tell you. <coughs> St sun star at the center, energy radiating colors across the sky. As on that first day, don't hold my hand. I know the way. His own small step, unshaken. Well, I did. I have written a couple of funny, funny poems. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll see what you think about it. And I, Jackie, I'm going to tell that poem. You know the one. I'm going to tell it. Mindy, I have read a lot of your uh, poetry from the past. Yeah, uh-oh. <laughs> you are affected a lot by food, aren't you? Uh, yeah, I, I guess so. I, I live among them. <laughs> yeah. But they are, they create images, I guess, for me. Look at those oaks I lived under out there on Bayview. Yeah. Grew up there. Moss hanging everywhere. Right. Yeah. Climbing. Mm -hmm. The trees. Yeah. I did climb trees. In fact, one of the poems I'll read is about climbing a tree. Um, let's, I've, I wrote this crazy poem, and I first th thought, I'm throwing this away. And then I decided to keep it. Some of you may know, uh, well, Susan, I know you know Richard Garcia. And he gave me a list of words when I was working with him. And they're crazy words. They're real words. But some we don't use. Some are from long ago. But um, I wrote the poem. And then I put it aside and during the pandemic years, an example of taking one of my old poems and working with it. And I felt like it turned out kind of fun. It was, it's certainly fun to read if I can keep, mis if I don't mispronounce the words, it'll be fun. No one will know. <laughs> In this poem, they won't, will they, Susan? Valentine. I find you in the half marrow, heart, spoon, afterclap of amaret and bow trap, full of lusty howdy wife, kissing cross light bed, love ship where we make babies in the eyes. You so gallant, a dashing man of fashion, in your plumpers, prangle, pull balloons, you rush ring of twatter light. And bitter and batter fang belly fried, smelling of clove and orange. Dream hole devil shine there under bright Winchester goose, I find you. You warp rascal, be sprangled and flutter flung. Um, in when I grew up in Georgetown, Phil and I went to school here, high school here in Betty, 
and we could go anywhere um, in any direction and not see a car, but particularly we would go from Georgetown to Mount Pleasant and Charleston and you didn't see anything. You're too young to remember. <laughs> but we could, we'd go right on through Mount Pleasant and go to the end of where the bridge started, go to the end on this side, and we, there was a restaurant called The Forks. You remember? Yes. Yep. Well, we can now remember that restaurant. Place. Yep. And we'd ha have either lunch or dinner there, and we were quite excited about it. This is not exactly a point about that, but I just wanted to say that so much happened along the road that you could spot real quick. It's not really a funny poem at all, but I'm going to read it. Drive from Charleston Airport on Highway North 17. That evening, sun going down, magenta shades or whatever that color, streaked across the sky, just beyond Allendahl, a scatter of houses, folks standing on the side of the road. Nearby lay two covered forms, neighbors embracing a woman, holding her up to bear what she cannot bear. I stopped, but a man, likely also a neighbor, face lit by the garish red rotation of a parked ambulance, motioned me to move on. Go on, go on, the man signals with his left arm. Um, agony chiseled on his face, <coughs> excuse me, as he approach, approaches our car. Let me read from Go On, Go On. <coughs> go on, go on, the man signals with his left arm, agony chiseled on his face as he approaches our car. Go on now, this be our business. The man's lips drawn, my mother's hand over her heart, those bodies there so near the road. Growing up in Georgetown, we, in the 40s, we knew that um, we heard all kind of tales about German, mostly German, wasn't it, Bill? Submarines being offshore. And um, they, there were all kind of stories, and I don't really have time to tell you about them, but it was a very real thing for those of us living and, and I lived on the Sanford River um, in Bayview, growing up there. 1944, the marsh grasses stubble here without plumes, closer to the shore, oyster midden, gone white. I'm where I want to be, house near the bay, where ships once came in, red tugboat guiding. It's a good enough home, often in need of mooring. Dare I open the screen door, then the half glass, half wood door. Mother in the kitchen, she is lovely, even without her red lipstick, fixing turnip greens in the big pot. There on the couch, Daddy, exhausted from the morning shift, one hand across his now clean shirt, Newspaper folded under. In my room, the one down the hall to the right, the window open, I climb out and sit in the chinaberry tree, feet dangling from the sturdiest limb as I wait for the expected stork, wondering why the big white bird doesn't stop. At night, we pull down the blackout shades the ones hiding us from the submarines lurking offshore beyond our eyes, fathoms deep. Now, Goat Hill. This poem probably happened pretty much the way I'm reading it. I, I always say it's the most autobiographical poem you'll ever know that I wrote, but one never knows how true that I am. 
In real life, I might not tell the truth. In the poems, I tell the truth. Goat Hill. There under the apple tree, bees frantic with rotten fruit, Colleen Cunningham hit me on the forehead with a milk bottle, at which point my run of a brother puffed up his seven-year-old self, let loose a swarm of expletives ending with, I'm going to beat the damn hell out of you. <laughs> While I stand, blood oozing into my left eye, stung by his language, so that I forgot Colleen, the neighborhood bully, bees a bumble in my brain as my mother, who had been ironing my white seersucker halter top, bolted from the kitchen, gave my bloody head a glance, grabbed my brother, mother of God, what did you say? While he, wild-eyed, scratches no seams in his hair, Sure, she was angry that he might hit Colleen. Blurts out, these damn bugs are biting the hell out of me. <laughs> Words hardly out of his mouth as she grabbed him by his shirt collar, dragged him up the steps, muttering, where did you get that language? While I stood there, the drone of bees, a bramble, me praying, stung by mother, who tended to other things. <laughs> and I'll end with this poem because I like to, if people want to talk a little bit. Okay, Jackie, sip your lip. <laughs> and, and Susan. Let's see. Well, where is it? When I graduated from high school, I was a terrible student in high school. I had friends like Betty Lee to tell me, te sh help me yeah. study. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I took off. I went to New York City. I wanted to go do something really big. I didn't know what it was going to be, but I was going to do it. And college was not the least bit on my mind. So here's the poem, the parable of the mustard seed, the shantus, and wild rice. Can we believe the mustard seed grows into a large tree, producing seed for the birds to gather? The ever-present sparrows build their nest, shake down the seeds borne by wind. Many are fed. The French called Edith Piaf la petite moineau, the little sparrow child raised in poverty in a brothel who sang her chansons on a street corner. Once I saw her at Versailles in New York. Who was this voice in this little frame belting out, padam, 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 fist clenched in pounding rhythm, her voice from across the sea sending her song of love, La Vie en Rose. Wild rice across the street gracefully dies, scatters seeds for any of the marsh folk to feed as it ages. The sparrow, chit-chit, whistling over near three red roses blooming on a bush three years dormant. I hear the faint, I hear the faint sound of cricket. I call it to me, the faith of its song. I send it out among the grains. Now, I'm going to tell you a story. When I went to New York, I, I made lots of wonderful young friends. We, we knew people who went to Columbia University, and I actually dated a basketball player. We won't go into that. <laughs> um, but I did date a very nice young man who took me to this restaurant, which is a very elegant restaurant. It may not even be there now, I don't know, but it was always had big stars. And there was Edith Piaf, and I had no idea who she was. I was totally stunned by her and couldn't wait to learn more about her, which I did over the years. So my friend, who was quite a handsome young man, he must have had money to take me there, he said, um, what can I get you to drink? 
and I'd never had much, any, you know, I've had tasted a martini and, at one point, but knew I didn't want that. And I said, well, in my most elegant way, I will have a Spanish fly. <laughs> and he looked at me and he says, what? <laughs> so I knew I'd done something wrong. <laughs> and I said, well, if I could just have a Coke, please. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Ed, we've got a little time, about five minutes or so. Yes. If anybody has a question or want to talk about anything. I'd like to know how many of you who are not from here know what no fool is. Oh, yes. She mentioned no fool. That's yeah. the one thing that hit me right before in the eyes. They were the bane of my existence. Well, they're still around. Yeah. yeah. As, as a foreigner here, we've learned the seasons of the year. There's no CM season, and that's followed by mayflies, which is followed by mosquitoes. So we know the seasons of the year. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm familiar for those of Florida. I don't see a lot here. I've seen them lately. In the last year, I think we saw some up up here, but it's mostly Florida. When I've gone to Florida, I've seen lovebirds. We're in your windshield. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I do want to mention that David and Ashley Harvard, who are here, to thank you for coming so much. They're going to be reading Thursday at, at 10, Dan. Yeah, that, yeah, at Waccamaw. At Waccamaw, that's right. Right, so right. I'll be there. Yeah, so you do? You're going to say something about that? Well, sure, yeah. Uh, okay. And, and we have flyers right back here as well on the table next to Living Hope that will be Oh, there. that's right. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, David and Ashley uh, Hewer visiting from uh, Louisiana, and they came to see Libby. They're big fans of each other's work. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Go if you have the time. They're yeah. both wonderful, interesting, lovely sure. poets. Yes. May I ask a more technical question um, about your line break? I'm so interested in how poets choose their line breaks. And does this yeah. poem appear breathe? Um, yes. Forth up from the bottom, shattered on. Um, would you tell us what, I mean, was this just a well, I didn't actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, it's a little bit different there. Okay. I mean, it wasn't, yeah, I was just curious. Okay. Yeah. Um, from I sit on the hospital steps to, well, it's just the first two lines. And then I sit on the hospital steps down to refused speech. Refused speech is on one line, and that, that, those lines are indented. It looks like about five spaces. And then, um, well, actually I did, um, when I get down to what you were talking about, um, that bowl held my life scattered on is one line and then into the kitchen floor. <clears throat> this kitchen floor, sweep it away and breathe. That's indented about five. And then the last two lines are like the first two. Um, I thought it was important to do the on, scattered on and then because I wanted the kitchen floor <laughs> to follow separated. And sometimes it's just by instinct that I decide 
I mean, people like Mary Oliver have all kind of rules. She says you better end on a strong um, word, noun, or verb. And um, what's his name? I can't think of his name. He's a wonderful poet, Hispanic poet. Says that when a lot of people want to know where, where the best line is in a poem, and he says it better be the one I'm reading. So you want to always do the best you can. I can't, he's such a great poet, and I can't think of his name Neruda. right now. Hmm? Neruda? No, it was not Neruda, it was Albert. Rios? Yes, that's who it is. Is it our Albert Rios? Rios, anyway, that's, it, Rios is his last name. Or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, good luck with that one. <laughs> Dan, yeah. I, I love a lot of your lines, but I especially love one of my favorites of all your lines is where did you get that language? Your, your mom, and probably through your life, but the way you use it in that poem is wonderful. And talking about your, your brother, cousin, but where did you get that language? But, it, you know, in, broader, in a broader sense, where do you get your language? Where did you get that language written? Uh, these are, a lot of people say they don't get poetry, it's, it, you know, it's too yeah. complex, it's, uh, it's out there, it, it's too far out there, but your poems are very, you know, we can get them, we can, they're, they're smart, but they're, they're also, uh, we can, they're experiences that we can share, you want your reader to share them. How does that, how do you, where does your language come from Well, thank you for saying that. Um, the main thing, I think, mo my early history, my grandfather was a preacher, and he was an evangelical preacher. And um, I can't remember his sermons, but I can hear his voice. Mm -hmm. And his children, my mother included, could all sing. I had one, her oldest brother actually was an accomplished um, New York New York, one of the New York um, City groups that sang opera, he was a member of that group and traveled all over singing. Um, but I think it's just the nuance of language and the rhythm of the language that helps me. And I've always felt like my language held me back because when I read, David, I read one of your poems, I'm just overwhelmed with what you know and I just can't write like that. I, it just sort of spills out. And I guess my language is, I try to listen to what people say and um, accomplish it in some way and br or bring it into to my writing. That's not a very good answer, but that's about the way it is. It's the only time I really listen carefully is when I'm drawn by some rhythm in a person's voice and I listen to their voice. And that, where did you get that language? You know, it just spilled out on the page because that's what she did. And I know where she, I know where he got that language. <laughs> <laughs> but I shall never say. But, and I'll tell you, Betty Lee, who Colleen Cunningham was, you may, remember, you may be spot on about who that was. was. Anyway. I guess, yeah. yeah, thank you, I guess so. Anything else? Thank you, Ruby. Thank, thank you, you so much for coming. I enjoyed it. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. What a wonderful personal experience this is. It's just a, a great experience together. And to have family friends who are here, this is uh, terrific as well. Uh, just to let you know, uh, concerning other activities of the Friends of the Library, uh, one is this coming Saturday, we have a postponed community yard sale. Uh, we have over 20 individuals, groups, churches that are going to be out here on the parking lot uh, back behind the library for our community yard sale, a wonderful community event.
come and if you if you like to come and sell, we can do that. That's not too late to do that. Or if you'd like to come and buy, that's what we would like as well. With a lot of good things up for sale this coming Saturday, from eight o'clock in the morning till noon. And then next month, our uh, uh, Tuesdays with presentation is going to be on raising a Gullah garden and what's involved in that and two individuals who are very much involved in gardening and uh, all kinds of plants, uh, Tim Chapman as well as who's a master gardener with uh, Clemson University as well as uh, Zenobia Harper, both of whom are involved in community gardens here in town, in Georgetown, are going to do a presentation on how you can raise a Gullah garden. And then the next month in um, um, May, is going to be Robin Salmon, who is the director of uh, art at Brook Green Garden, is going to speak on the art of Brook Green Garden. It'll be a 20-hour presentation. Uh, <laughs> I'm joking. We're going to narrow, she's going to narrow that topic down to one particular. She could go on and on, and it would be absolutely wonderful. Um, but we're going to narrow it down to one particular subject. But I know you want to be here for that as well. Always the third Tuesday at uh, 10 o'clock, and I uh, hope you'll join us at that time. Thank you again. Thank you, Libby, so very, very much. Glad to have you all here, and I uh, hope you have a wonderful day. And uh, love the noise back here. Thank you for putting up with that. I didn't hear it that much. <laughs>